Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Katie Pigden, the editor of the publication. I'm delighted you can join us for today's episode, which forms part of a special series with financial planner Chanel Patterson. Last year, Chanel launched her own podcast, Her Future Bright, in which she interviews inspiring women in financial services. Money Marketing is proud to have partnered with Chanel for the second series. Each week, Chanel will be finding out about her guests' careers, their achievements, and how they are bringing the profession forward. As Money Marketing Strapline proudly states, financial advice matters. We want to show the world of advice can be a fulfilling career choice. For any aspiring planners and advisors listening, we hope this series helps you make the leap. And if you're looking for more information, visit our financial advisor to be resource on the Money Marketing website. Now it's over to you, Chanel. Hey everyone, I'm Chanel Pattinson and this is Her Future Bright, a podcast where I interview inspiring women in finance. We talk about their their careers, their achievements and how they are bringing our profession forward. On this week's show, we have Davinia Tomlinson. Hey, hi Davinia, how are you? I'm good, thank you Chanel. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no, I'm very, very excited. I know we've got lots of interesting things to talk about. So for anyone that doesn't know Davinia, she is the founder of RainCheck, a business she launched in 2018 to help women take control of their financial future, which is amazing. So to start things off, could you please tell us a bit more about your career so far? Yeah. So um, I suppose starting with the most recent developments, so as you said, you know, RainCheck is three and a half years old now. Um, And it was really born out of my desire to close some of the financial gaps that I saw springing up within the industry. So I started my career um, many years ago um, on a graduate scheme within the the asset management industry. And it was brilliant, you know, particularly as somebody that was moving from Birmingham, um, moving down to London and joining the very exciting world of financial services. It was a world that I'd always really loved. I've shared this anecdote many times before, but I'm a child of the 80s. So I grew up on Working Girl being one of my iconic movies. Um, and for anybody that knows, Chanel's probably like, what are you even on about? But for anybody that is also a child of the 80s or even just um, somebody that's a bit of a movie buff, you will know that it was basically, you know, one of the first in that generation of kind of, um, you know, where women were really in power roles within a financial services type company. Um, And it really left a lasting impression on me, you know, seeing these amazing women, of course they were rivals by the end, but seeing these amazing women doing great things really kind of set my tiny imagination going as to what kind of career I might have in future. So when I joined the city, I remember, you know, really feeling like, wow, I've arrived. I absolutely loved it. And I remember thinking, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it in this way at that time. But I remember thinking the one thing that I loved most about the world of investment management was its ability to transform people's lives. Um, And I guess at the same time, recognizing that it was very much an exclusive world. It seemed to be the preserve of people that were arguably high net worths, ultra high net worths, people that had huge amounts of money to invest, that already lived a certain lifestyle, that occupied a certain socioeconomic group. Um, And although I didn't have any strong resistance to it at that stage, I am somebody that also enjoyed all the trappings of city life and the luxury handbags and, you know, designer shoes and all that. Um, But I very much started to think, well, why is that? You know, I I have a very curious mind. So it was more a question of, okay, well, obviously there is a fundamental challenge here for people that may not have, you know, enough money to invest, but then maybe they have the desire to climb the ladder from an economic perspective and they just lack the awareness, knowledge, guidance and information to know what to do. So that was very much the kind of seed that was planted at that stage. Um, and then, of course, you know, having come off that graduate scheme, you know, and doing lots of investment management exams and the qualifications and everything else, I realized, you know, I really would like to find out more about customer behavior and, you know, people's kind of I guess more broadly than customer behavior, more specifically than that, rather, you know, their investor behavior. Why are people making certain decisions? Where are people investing? Where do these people come from? What are their demographics? What do they look like? Um, And then just kind of confirming some of the hypotheses I'd already had around the fact that, yes, this is very much, you know, one small segment of society. Um, It's very male dominated. 
what can we do to open up access? And so that led me into marketing and thinking, okay, how can we develop products and how can we develop propositions that appeal to a wider um, segment of the population? And that, I guess, you know, kind of kickstarted my interest in financial inclusion. So, you know, the city and I guess the corporate world in general, there's a huge buzz right now. And I, I feel like it's it's probably gone on for you know decades around diversity and inclusion. And then thinking about financial inclusion as a subset of that, you know, how can we promote better economic outcomes for a broader range of people, you know, financial security, um, securing financial futures, building wealth should not be something that, you know, masses, massive amounts of, of the general population are excluded from. Um, and, you know, as somebody that comes from, you know, again, I talk about this all the time because I think it's really pivotal to my story and my journey over the course of my career. And certainly what prompted me to set up Raincheck. I come from a very matriarchal background and culture um, where, you know, as much as I had very strong male cheerleaders in my corner telling me that I could do anything and be anything, lots of my influences, both in the workplace and at home, came from very inspiring, powerful women. Um, and so I always sought that out. You know, when I started my career, I always sought out those women and there were very few of them, but I always sought out those women that were, you know, doing amazing things that were climbing the career ladder that were somehow, you know, in a very superhuman like way, managing to combine being mothers, being, um, you know, powerful professionals at work and, you know, having those women in my corner who could help me navigate and steer through this very, um, labyrinthine world of finance really helped me to think, okay, actually there is a place for me here, but what does that place look like? And so rain check is very much my kind of, I would say, you know, my contribution to addressing some of the challenges that I saw springing up, you know, specifically as it relates to women, I think as somebody that has been so championed and cheerleaded by women, I felt like, well, actually, if there is a gap here for women in terms of what we can achieve from a financial perspective, I want to be part of the change in doing something about that. And hence, Rain Check was born. Amazing. What an amazing story. I love that. I love <laughs> sort of going out and seeking those women to sort of look up to and whether yeah. it's mentorship or it's one of the reasons I created this podcast was to be able to hear women like you and other amazing women tell their story and sit there and think, I could do that. Like, Absolutely. I've got every chance of doing that. So no, I, I love that. And so you mentioned you started your career on a traditional asset management graduate program, and then you moved mm -hmm. into marketing. So I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about that because that obviously is qu quite a change. I know it's sort of mm -hmm. doing marketing in that area, but obviously it is a yes. change of path. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. So what I realized, I mean, of course, the, but the traditional path for people that started on my program was that, you know, you would do your IMC. So we all started in the same way. We did our investment management qualification. And then from there, you would kind of progress on to CFA. And I remember going to all of the open evenings um, and all of the welcome days with, you know, all the other people on my in my cohort, my graduate cohort, and thinking, yeah, I mean, this is fine. It's kind of an extension of IMC. That's cool but I don't really love it. And this is really intense. Like, you know, the pass rate for CFA even now globally, it's, it's low and it's deliberately low because, you know, it's very demanding, very taxing, and they want to make sure that they are, you know, putting people through who are the very best. And from my perspective, I was like, you know, anything that I put my mind to, I was already very determined and, you know, very kind of self-assured, even as, you know, 22 year old. And I was like, anything I put my mind to, I know I can achieve. But at the same time, I also know if I don't love it, I'm not really going to commit to it in the way that I will need to. And this is going to demand so much of my time. Is this really going to, and again, I wouldn't have been thinking like, you know, is this going to spark joy? I definitely wouldn't have been thinking about it like that, but I certainly would have been like, what's the opportunity cost of this for me? Like if I devote several hours of my existence, I've just moved to London, I'm excited. I want to be out there. You know, I, I, <laughs> I want to do what I want to do. I love, you know, my, I love this role and I love everything that I'm, ex and I'm learning about with regard to investment management. I love it. But really my strength is being out and building relationships and, you know, in the communications, that's where I excel. That's where I've always excelled. So as much as I can do the exams and crunch the numbers, is that really where my career lies? And so I had to, you know, it's, it's quite early in your career to kind of decide you reach this fork in the road and go, 
Well, are you going to be someone that goes down the more analytical number crunching route? Or are you someone that is more suited to, as I say, you know, building deep building relationships, thinking about how you can develop products and strategy? Are you better suited to that? And obviously on balance, I decided that the latter option was better for me. And I think, you know, occasionally there were certain points, you know, where I was like, oh God, you know, I would see, you know, people from, from my cohort go off and do their CFA. And then some of them became fund managers. Some of them, you know, they were doing all sorts of things. And I thought, oh God, like, did I make the wrong decision? And it's very interesting. I mean, as I say, you know, having to make a decision at that stage in your career, it's quite, I mean, it's quite early to have to decide, you know, something that could potentially define the rest of your life. I mean, I know, of course, I could have gone back at any point and done CFA, but I realized that my, you know, I was almost vindicated in my decision when I, you know, if you fast forward to when I um, moved into one of the, I would say it's a career defining role for me when I moved to Octopus Investments. um, And I remember thinking to me, my training in looking at things through a marketing lens and through a strategic marketing lens, because I think people have lots of misconceptions about marketing, particularly from the finance world. And it was certainly, you know, I had to have the the courage of my convictions because I'll never forget the conversation I had with my um, kind of graduate coordinator in that role and saying, well, you know, I was kind of squeaking it out like, oh gosh. um, So I've decided I don't really want to do CFA. I don't really, no, this is, I'm, (laughs) and people that know me, they know that I, have no issue projecting my voice um, and being open and communicating. But I remember that meeting, I was so hot and I was just like, this is awful. And she was brilliant. And she said, you know, you've made, you know, you're making the right decision for yourself. And if you are confident in that decision, then we will support you in moving into a role that will facilitate you. And that was one of the beauties of the graduate scheme. So I was a big champion of of that company um, and everything that I went on to learn there. But I think, as I say, you know, I was really vindicated in that decision when I went to Octopus and realized that from a strategic marketing perspective, thinking about how do we reach people that have otherwise been ignored. Um, we are selling pro- you know, propositions and products and services that are not necessarily considered mainstream investments. We have to think about the language that we're using to communicate with people. We have to think about how we can break this down. There's no reason for, you know, the financial services industry has been mired in, you know, unfortunate mis-selling scandals, for example. Um, there is a reputation for this unnecessary use of jargon so that the average person can't even understand what it is that they're buying. And it just undermines the whole industry when you consider that ultimately what we're trying to do is transform people's fortunes and help them to secure their financial futures and build legacy. So why are we making it so hard for people to understand what they're putting their money into? And I think, you know, as a result of my training and thinking about what kinds of, you know, who are we, who are we developing these products and services for? Who's the, the target audience? There's no better training that that I could have had than working at Octopus in understanding the mechanics of building products and services to suit the target audience rather than just building what we liked and trying to shove it on them because we think we're smarter than the audience. Um, And I think that's a very important distinction because I think historically the industry has become renowned for just building things that we think are really clever assuming that we know way more than the target audience. And that's borne out, you know, in all, you know, whether it's through the intermediaries and distribution um, in the product development side of things, there has been a very strong sense of our superiority over the target audience. And at Octopus, it was a, a very refreshing, complete change in emphasis and focus on customer um, in a very real way. You know, lots of companies talk about customer obsession, which I think is really weird because nobody wants to be obsessed over, you know, it feels like stalking. Um, but Octopus really meant it when they said, you know, actually we're putting you at the heart of things. We want to know what you think and feel, and then we're going to build products and services to help you achieve that. They meant it. Um, and it, it really transformed me and, and transformed my mindset in terms of Actually, there is a way for you to be purpose-led, but also make profit. Amazing. It's like a real light bulb moment for me. 
Uh, no, amazing. I I love Octopus as a company. <laughs> um, I honestly do. It's a bit weird. I um I had Ruth, the CEO, on the the last wow. series, and um she was just amazing. And one of the things I said to her was, every individual that I've ever met who's worked at Octopus has always been the kindest, most loveliest person. Oh, honestly, they have, and it just used to blow my mind because you know there's always there's always one or but with Octopus, <laughs> everyone it was so lovely, and I said. Mm. How do you do it? And she was like, it just starts at the top. She said, it's so important yes. to have that all the way through the company that we want kind, lovely people. And that's, we recruit on that basis of having mm-hmm. that sort of person. And I think it's really, really amazing. And you sort of mentioned it a bit there, but they're very forward thinking in, in the world of financial services. So, and you obviously, it sounds like you had an amazing time there. So tell us a bit more about what your, what your role was. Yeah. So at the time I was working on VCTs, which I was really excited by because I remember thinking, okay, so we're working within the tax efficient investment space. So having, you know, had a background in more, you know, arguably more mainstream and I was working on the institutional side when I was in asset management, but, you know, more mainstream investment uh, products, funds, um, solutions, if you like. And then suddenly, you know, entering into a world of what would have been considered, you know, alternatives in, you know, alternative investments or tax efficient investments, um, which was something that I had, you know, very limited understanding of in the past. And when I started to find out more about VCTs and, you know, it was a real deep dive into this completely new world, which I love. So I love, you know, being thrown in at the deep end and having to learn everything from the bottom up and really understand the intricate details of something. And I realized, wow, there is a massive opportunity here for, you know, this solution, which is considered high risk, you know, with good reason, obviously by the regulator. But in terms of how we can deliver this message to people who could really benefit when they're thinking about their tax planning, how we can deliver um, the, you know, how it can help them, what the benefits are for them, rather than just saying, right, this is a VCT, it's very similar to that VCT and that VCT, you know, just pick one at random with, you know, with a blindfold on. Instead, we were able to say, right, let's look at how our VCTs differ as an organization, how they might suit different types of customer. Because yes, you know, if you take ultimately the VCT is like a wrapper and so they are similar in terms of the tax benefits, but what lies beneath the wrapper? What is the expertise of the the fund management team who are running this money for you? Um, Where is your money going? How can we, you know, really ram home the points of investors that actually there is no reason. Yes, you you know, obviously the, the biggest driver for lots of people is, okay, I'm trying to manage my tax affairs and, you know, obviously I've been advised to look into this. And we were always thinking, okay, well, where in the past we might have been developing our marketing literature, for example, to appeal to the financial advisors so that they can explain it to the end investor what we realized is that we were really missing an opportunity to speak directly to that end investor because ultimately the investor is the one that's putting their money in. Yes, you have an intermediary who's acting on your behalf, but the very best financial advisors in our experience were the ones that were like, we're going to tell you everything that you need to know about it, but you've got to make the final decision. Like we're not trying to infantilize you and tell you that you don't know anything at all and we're smart, you're dumb, give us the money, sign here and you know that's it, you're invested. Instead, how can we you know, make it so that they recognize not only am I benefiting in this way, but I could also benefit in that way if I went to another provider. In addition, my money is going to fuel some of the best and brightest British British startups. That's a big deal because I think for a long time, you know, when you think about, um, I don't know, the startup space or, you know, maybe backing businesses, lots of people go, oh gosh, like I couldn't put my money into a startup company or, how would I even begin to think about being an investor into some of these really interesting companies? I mean, if you think of Zoopla back in the day, or even Gray's, some of these really exciting companies that you're probably a customer of or an avid user of, you would never think, oh, hang on a second, I could actually be an investor in that company through my VCT investment. That's a really big deal. So suddenly you're you're creating interest, you're creating buzz, you are creating an awareness, not just of how uh, these propositions are investing in the pipeline of, you know, future British startups um, and really providing a lifeline for them. You know, when you consider the funding gap in this country, and I guess it's a global phenomenon and how difficult it is for companies to get access to money that can help them grow and scale their businesses. And Octopus is providing a platform through which on the one side, 
we're able to provide funding to those businesses, which is a brilliant thing and can help support the ambitions of the UK economy and the government. And then on the other hand, give access to average investors who may not be investing millions of pounds, but they can also have some skin in the game. Suddenly you're creating this beautiful ecosystem where everybody benefits. And yes, of course, there are the risks associated with it. You know, I don't, I don't make any attempt to um, undersell that. There are risks. But having an understanding of those risks, but also going, actually, I really believe in this business and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and back it. And it will be offset by some of the benefits that I can derive. That's an amazing thing. Um, and so I really, really, you know, of everything, of anything that I've done in my career, I would say getting to be so fully immersed in the world of VCTs and to see quite how diverse it was um, and quite how many I guess different levers there were, you know, thinking about the policy development, thinking about um, the regulatory implications, um, you know, how we could make sure that we were, of course, you know, abiding by all of the financial promotions rules and COPS for handbook and all of that stuff. But at the same time, doing it because we really believed in it. Like, of course, we had no interest in trying to obscure the realities of, you know, how risky some of these companies might be or, you know, trying to mislead anyone, trying to missell in any, in any way at all, but to set things out in plain English, this is how you might benefit, but this is also what you might potentially lose. And you have to be aware on both sides and make a decision that works best for you. And then I guess, you know, the biggest thing for me was, you know, when you think about illustrations, it's one of the, one of the biggest challenges that this industry faces, because there is so little consistency in terms of not just fees, but also, you know, how can you measure performance? And I guess with all different companies depicting this differently, it's virtually impossible for you to make a like for like comparison. And I remember us spending hours and days and weeks. We spent a really long time on this specific subject and we would triangulate across the company and say, right, we need people who work in client relations and operations um, and, you know, obviously marketing and the fund management teams. We all need to get together and figure out how we can make this as clear as we can possibly make it. So exactly as you described, Chanel, I mean, the idea of, you know, for Octopus and for anybody that worked there, it really courses through the DNA of the company, certainly when I was there in terms of we need to make sure we're doing the right thing for the investor at all times. And we need to make sure that we can explain it in such a way that anybody with no background at all in this industry can understand. And we took that role and responsibility very seriously. And it was the thing that I loved most. Amazing. Amazing. I'm just such a huge fan of Octopus, honestly. <laughs> um, I just think they are brilliant. And that sounds amazing. I think more financial services company that head their head that way with their documents, their marketing, it will just mm. be hugely beneficial to the the financial services industry. And I think they will. It just may be a little bit slow, but I think we will we will definitely get there. Definitely. Um, so in 2017 you did an MBA at the CAS Business School. An MBA is on my sort of bucket list at some Amazing. point. I'd love to do one. So I'd love for everyone to sort of know a bit about what it taught you and, and if it made a, a difference to your career. Yeah. You know, I think for me, the the MBA was kind of an exercise in, I don't want to say buying confidence, but effectively it was, it was a very expensive exercise in buying the confidence <laughs> to set up my own business. And I think, you know, at that stage with everything that I had learned and everything that I'd experienced in my career, I knew that I was um, somebody that was a bit of a free spirit. I mean, anybody that's worked with me would probably say the best way to manage Dav is to not try to manage her. <laughs> If anybody's listening to this that's, that was an old boss, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I think it's well known that, you know, I come to things with full energy and enthusiasm. If I'm into it, so, you know, it comes back to this point I was making about the CFA. If I'm into it, I will give it everything. Um, but I really like to approach things in a way that might, may or may not make sense to other people, but it, it makes sense to me. And I will follow the thread of that journey, you know, pulling in advice and opinions from other people, but it's important that I have the autonomy to, you know, make those decisions and figure things out for myself. Um, and I think, you know, having had the experiences that I'd had and seen how, as I say, particularly Octopus was able to make such a massive impact. It was like, you know, being, you know, relatively small in the industry at the time compared to where they are now and to make such a mighty impact, even at that stage, really left an impression on me and made me think, wow, 
I'm so inspired by their entrepreneurial journey. And it's just helped to crystallize in my mind, one of the ambitions that I had started to bury, um, which was to be my own boss and to, you know, set up my own business. And at the time it was thinking, you know, what kind of business could it be? And I think, you know, as I say, you know, with everything that I had experienced coming from a background in which, um, you know, women were very much, very much took the lead, um, were responsible for managing the household budgets. You know, it's a, it's a situation that you see up and down the country where women are the primary managers of the household purse. And for me, and, and I think that the thing that I should also say is that growing up with a very inspiring grandmother, really formidable woman, who is fortunately still with us and who even despite being very traditional classic Caribbean matriarch Windrush generation had come here was working in you know we are a very working class family with a big emphasis on education and she had a financial advisor my grandmother is not the kind of person that you would consider if you were to do a lineup of people who's got a financial advisor and you look at the demographics you know this um, Caribbean matriarch would not be part of the lineup and she had a financial advisor called Peter. And we grew up with Peter coming to the house regularly. You know, he was very much a part of our family. And he used to advise her on her investments. And she has made incredible investments as a result of the advice that she received. And I think that obviously left, left a lasting impression on me because I wouldn't have dreamt at that stage that I would have gone on to set up a business for women that's helping to bridge the advice gap and to promote financial education and help women make really sound decisions with their money. But that's really where the germ of the idea was planted, you know, in recognizing the power that, you know, my my grandmother got from getting this advice from Peter. But Peter knew he couldn't tell my grandma what to do. He could just advise. And so it's really important, you know, when I come back to this point about as an industry, we should not be trying to impose any sense of superiority on the on the customer. Our role is to guide to coach, to inspire, to lead, to inform, and then say, but ultimately the decision is yours in a completely non-condescending, non-patronizing way. And I think to some degree that has potentially got lost in certain quarters. So when I did my MBA, you know, I'd started to become quite confident, at least in my decision that, you know, I want to do something that is going to address some of the issues that I see around financial inclusion. You know, when I think about my grand, would my gran be ever be a customer of, you know, some of these companies that I have worked for without a Peter, probably not. But, you know, I think, you know, if you think about some of her peers who didn't have Peter, they wouldn't have had, had even have had the opportunity to even be told about some of these things. So I was starting to become quite clear in my mind, this is where the opportunity is to have. And the MBA for me was basically me saying, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't know anything about business. Yes, I've kind of seen how it might work in practice. Um, and I've been inspired by some great entrepreneurs. I avidly read any kind of profile on entrepreneurs of businesses that I like, but how do I start this ball rolling? And I did the MBA for that reason. And I think I got out of it exactly what I wanted to get out of it. So I think, you know, as I say, it's, you know, they're very expensive. I came from a business background anyway. I had a business degree. So I didn't go into it thinking, okay, I'm going to learn more about the mechanics of business or the theoretical side of business. But what I wanted to learn was, you know, I wanted to get access to networks and I wanted to meet other entrepreneurs potentially. And I wanted to feel that I was part of a community of people who were potentially doing similar things to me because there were other budding entrepreneurs on the program um, and potentially meet people that I could build a business with or that I could work with in some way. And it absolutely fulfilled that ambition for me. So I think in terms of investing in myself, which I'm a really strong advocate of, you know, I always feel like if you don't invest in yourself, if you don't champion and cheerlead yourself, how can you expect anyone else to? So I'm always someone before anyone's got a chance to give me praise or give me feedback constructively or otherwise, I've already done it myself. I'm extremely self-aware. I'm extremely kind of, you know, self-advocating and my MBA for me was like my biggest, as I say, my biggest financial investment in myself, which I think when I think about, you know, when I came off the MBA, I, I graduated while six months pregnant and I couldn't wait for it to be over. Cause I was like, Oh, for God's sake. Like I was writing my dissertation of feeling like I just, I've got my head in a toilet. This is terrible. When will this end? <laughs> and it just, it almost feels like a kind of, um, it felt quite poetic in many ways because to be building a business that is for women to help them manage their finances more effectively. And then to have had one daughter already 
and to be pregnant with my second daughter and graduating, it felt like a really nice kind of way to round things off before, you know, launching Rain Check. Amazing. And that leads perfectly into our next question, which <laughs> is that you launched Rain Check in 2018. So yes. tell us a bit more about what it is. And you've told us how you sort of got there, but tell us a bit more about how it is and how it was launching the business. Yeah. So Rain Check is really, I mean, we started as um, a kind of annual membership and it, it remains a membership, but it's it's changed um, tack or focus slightly. So it was very simply a way to give women access to good quality financial advice delivered by a female financial advisor um, and then really good quality financial education, which was delivered in the form of content. So it was audio and written content. So it would basically be me doing explainer, um, almost like mini podcasts, if you like. So I'd basically, you know, be recording myself talking about, you know, in a minute talking about uh, what do we mean by tax efficient investing? What do we mean by EIS, VCT, um, index fund, all of these different things, asset allocation, diversification, you know, breaking down lots of the jargon. That was really where we started. You know, I wanted to demystify the world of finance and investing because I recognized that, you know, as somebody, even with, you know, the network that I had, you know, built up in the city of really amazing, ambitious, professional women, there was still a big gap in terms of our understanding of financial services. And, you know, I was like, but it's really not rocket science. And it started to infuriate me that it, that these very clever women were made to feel like it was something that was beyond their grasp. I was like, this is completely out of order. Like you should know exactly what it is you might be putting your money into. And there shouldn't be, if you do decide, you know, actually, you know, Dav, I prefer to keep my money in a savings account that's fine. That suits me. I do understand these other things, but I just don't want to do it. That's fair enough. But making a decision on the basis that you don't understand to me felt like a massive injustice. And so, you know, Rain Check really started from that premise, like wanting to break down some of that jargon so that as a minimum, women could feel like, oh, okay, that's explained that really simply. So now I understand. And I don't need, you know, it kind of takes the sting out of it. I don't need to feel like in those conversations, I need to opt out or I feel stupid or, you know, or I need to ask, you know, one of the men in my life, like I can understand this and I can explain it to someone else. So that was the first step. And then the second step was, you know, I'm very big on kind of, this is about more than just a talking shop. We are women that are taking action. And the best way for us to take action is that, you know, I very much believed in financial advice. I still believe in financial advice. Um, I think there, it's one of the best ways to bridge this gap when it comes to the you know investing and pensions and all of this stuff. Um, but because, and I think, you know, it remains today, this kind of dearth of female financial advisors in the industry relative to men, you know, this is disproportionately male. I think for lots of women, and I, you know, I, I caveat that by saying, I don't automatically think because you were a woman, you only want to speak to other women. That would be ludicrous. But at the same time, when you consider that, you know, there's study after study that show that people in general, but certainly women, we are happier talking about our sex lives and all manner of other things than our finances, because we consider finances way too intimate to discuss with a stranger, but we're happy to have these random sex chats. <laughs> I'm like, there's something really wrong. Like, I mean, it's fine, but it's also like, there's something wrong with that. So I wanted to create a, an environment within which women felt really comfortable speaking to someone that they could relate to, someone that didn't try to patronize them. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that only women are able to deliver that. But I was on a mission to find what I considered to be the best female financial advisors in the country to partner with on Rain Check. And I spoke to women everywhere. I mean, it was, I, I remember having like, you know, this tiny baby. Um, my second daughter was three months old and I was chatting with women all over the country and I was pulling in my network and saying, do you know any, like, I need to speak to some female financial advisors. Can you just, can you make these introductions? And I've got such amazing, again, amazing people in my network, men and women that were like, why don't you chat with this person? Why don't you chat with that person? And I spoke to several women. I probably spoke to a dozen, two dozen women up and down the country. And I was like, I just need one woman. I need one woman to launch this business because it's not like I'm going to be inundated with like thousands of customers on day one, but I just need one woman that I can say, right, when we get our first customer, you are going to be meeting with this financial advisor. And I can vouch for her because I've spoken with her and I know exactly what she's about. I know the energy that she's going to radiate and you're going to feel good in her presence and feel empowered to make a really confident decision for yourself. So 
for me, you know, when I was conducting those kind of, you know, semi interviews, if you like, it was as much about those women taking a gamble ultimately on rain check and particularly if they didn't know me and saying, okay, this new business, do I want to put my name to it? Cause I don't know. I don't know, dad, like this could bomb completely. And, you know, it could blow up spectacularly. Like I've got my own reputation to consider. Um, but then from my perspective, and this is the thing that I always say to people going into interview situations in general, when you're going for a job, it's not just the employer that's interviewing you. You have to interview them for cultural fit. And I don't know where I got that from. Again, it's probably, I don't know where I, I think this really comes from growing up and, and being cheerleaded all the time. But I always had this thought when I'd go into interviews, do I, do I like the feel of this company? Even as a very young woman, you know, am I going to thrive here? Am I going to be happy here? Can I have a laugh in this environment or am I going to feel really stifled? And similarly, when I was going through and having these conversations with women about, you know, partnering with Raincheck. Uh, from a financial advice perspective, it was, you know, do I, re- you know, it, it wasn't just, do I like these women? Do I know their credentials? Yes, that was part of it too. But it was, what kind of feeling do I have in their presence? You know, let me road test them and, and share with them something about myself from a financial perspective and see how we work through these different scenarios. And the lady that I eventually uh, worked with, you know, we subsequently took on, you know, I subsequently partnered with another financial advisor, but the first woman that I worked with, I remember when I walked into her office and she immediately radiated such lovely, warming energy. It was so comforting to be in her presence. And I think, I mean, even this scenario that I'm describing, it's probably one that few people would consider when they can, when they think about their financial advice relationship, people probably don't think of it in that way. And I remember thinking at that time, Dav, I think you're probably onto something with this because for the first time, financial advice is probably boxed into a really cold, cardboardy, you know, gray area of the industry. People just think, oh, you know, they're just going to sell you things and then get commission and that's it. They don't really care to know anything about you. And, but for the people that I knew, I was like, you know, that feels like a really unfair indictment of the whole industry. Because when I met this woman and I was like, you know, for the experience that I would like to have and the experience that I would want my mom or my sister or my grand, my best friends to have. I mean, Peter was phenomenal. Peter was part of our family. Peter, my grandmother's financial advisor, he used to come, he would sit down and have dinner with us. He'd have a cup of tea. <laughs> he'd come in and he'd be like, are you all right, Rita? How have you been? Amazing. How, like it was amazing. And I was like, I need to replicate the Peter and Rita show. For all rain check customers, all rainmakers need to experience what my grand experience with Peter. And that was, this is a reputation or this is a relationship built on mutual respect, admiration and trust. And all we're doing is replicating that in a woman built by women for women environment. And so that was how rain check started. So it was, if you signed up, you would pay a single fee and you would get access to two financial advice sessions and all of the content. And I think importantly, the thing that I always stressed for anybody that came on board was that you are under no obligation to invest or to take up any of the recommendations you receive from the financial advisor. And and hence why it was so important that the person I partnered with didn't feel that she had a sales target attached to the work that she was doing with us. Um, Mm -hmm. And she didn't. So she could spend time with them, holding their hand, explaining. And that's very much, you know, how she works. That's her her entire ethos anyway. But for lots of the rainmakers, if you consider that this for lots of them would have been their first, you know, experience with a financial advisor. So they couldn't be rushed through the process um, and be, you know, thrust into an an environment where they were uh, forced to make a decision. That was really important to me. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of customer experience am I trying to cultivate? Yes, the financial advice, they have, you know, anybody that's working with the Rainmakers has to be regulated and qualified and have this kind of threshold competence. Of course, that's standard. But what are they going to get from the rain check experience that's different from anywhere else? And it really was the warm embrace. You know, it's the financial advice, but delivered with a warm embrace. We've got your back. Any question that you have, come to us we are part of a community. That is what we are building. And you will feel part of the genesis of what that will look like. That's amazing. I love that. That's like the best sort of, this is how I got here and this is how the company got here story <laughs> ever. Like, I'm Thank in love you. with Peter and that he gives <laughs> yeah. us such a good name. P- like, I, Peter and hear, Rita. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. You hear, obviously, exactly as you said, we do sometimes have a bit of a bad reputation. Everyone's heard the stories. Mm. But when you hear stories about Peter... 
I'm just obsessed. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love it. Oh, but I love that's how you got to to rain check and what it, it's doing is just it's just amazing. Uh, but the next few questions I like to ask all guests. So we're basically just going to talk a bit about your highs and your lows and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. So firstly, what would you say is the most important lesson that you've learned in your career so far? I think for me, it's been, hmm, it's a great question. I think where I'm kind of reversing, reverse engineering it. I think where I have felt unhappy with things or um, made a misstep has been where I haven't raised something that I think might be a problem whether it's to do with an interpersonal relationship with teams that I've worked with or whether it's to do with a decision that I think might be the wrong one. When I don't speak up and and raise my, you know, a, you know, air my concerns early, it's, it's just never ended well. It doesn't mean that there's been a catastrophic outcome, but I think, you know, I'm a very firm believer in being in an environment in which you have I guess you have, um, it's not even a luxury, but where you feel safe enough and secure enough to raise a concern without fear of reprisals, I think. And so it's really important for anyone listening that, you know, if there is something that's nagging away at you and keeping you up at night, I mean, there were some times that I would think, I really don't think that's the right direction that we should be taking, or I don't think that we should be making that decision or doing this or doing that on on all manner of different topics. And I would take it home and I would think about it and turn it over. And then I'd wake up at three in the morning going, oh God, like, or I would dream about it, almost nightmares. I would dream about these things. And I always realized like, if you would just have said it at the time, Dav, I mean, nothing bad ever happens from you saying it, even if they still decide ultimately, no, we're still going to go down this path. But, you know, I, I respect you for raising your concerns. There is, you know, at least you've got it off your chest. You can feel like, you know, I've done everything that I could possibly do to change the course of that decision. So I would always say, you know, being it's kind of speaking your truth, standing your ground. There is something in that area, you know, feeling confident enough to do that. Even if you squeak, even if your knees tremble and your voice shakes, just speaking up, I think is really important. And anybody listening, they'd probably go, Dad, when have you not spoken up? And I'm like, quite a number of times, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, t- I totally agree there. And I also, something I've realized recently is that often the worst case scenario that you think is going to happen very far from right. that actually happens. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's never as bad as you think. 99% of the time is, is mm-hmm. what I've learned. Um, but okay. So the next question is what is the biggest obstacle in your career that you've had to overcome so far? Hmm. Big question. Oh, wow. (laughs) Biggest obstacle. I would say, I think for me, I mean, one, one experience I had was, and I think there are probably lots of people that can relate to this, but I am somebody because I'm quite, I'm so open. I'm so straightforward in the way that I talk. And some people really gel with that, you know, octopus, that was fine because that, you know, it was brilliant. In fact, because, you know, I was surrounded by similar people. So we could have a good dust up and still be friends. Loved it. Such a brilliant culture <laughs> for me at least. Um, but then, you know, I've also had experiences where if you were being led by someone, And I've always been someone that has such a lot of respect and admiration for people in leadership positions. It doesn't mean that I will kowtow or capitulate to everything that they say, um, because as I say, free spirit. But at the same time, I do have a lot of respect for people in leadership positions and I trust them to make good judgments. But also I trust them. I trust there to be a reciprocity of respect, which means because you are leading me, it doesn't mean that you have supremacy over me or dominance. And I want to feel that I can come to you with suggestions and that you'll take them on board. And I think the biggest obstacle for me has been in a scenario in which, you know, a new leader had joined the team and I was super excited, you know, somebody new has come along and, you know, I, you know, you want to share all the different things that you think you might be able to do differently. Um, and it wasn't so much that I felt I was being 
sidelined, but it was more that I felt that this individual didn't really understand me or I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one because personalities are different, but I certainly felt that under this person's leadership, there was simply no way I would have had the opportunity to thrive, to develop, to grow. And for me as somebody that was always really ambitious, but was always looking for experiences, you know, how can I learn this? So I'm really interested in that. And the best environments for me were always the ones in which yes, get your, you know, get your job done. We've hired you to do this, but absolutely be free to explore and to build relationships across the company, find out about the inner workings and the mechanics of everything that we do here. And under this person's leadership, I felt that that was being stifled. I was being told repeatedly, why are you having that conversation or what are you doing, doing that? And I would say, well, I've, I've delivered all of these other things. Like this is what I'm doing. And I, I had started to take steps to flex my style and to say, that, you know, it, it's important to you to know what I'm doing. It's effectively being micromanaged and you can imagine how that went down with me. <laughs> so I would say, okay, one of the ways that I can mitigate that is to say, right, here's an email at the end of every week. So I've summarized what I'm doing and, you know, over to you, if there's any area that you would like to delve more deeply into, but at least this will set the tone for our one-to-ones. But then what would happen in those one-to-ones is that we talk about everything except, you know, the things that I was working on and instead focus on how I needed to change my approach, or I needed to change my, it's almost like, you know, you need to change your personality because you're over there having conversations there. And that's really, you know, I don't want people in the team to be doing that. I don't want you, you know, yes, it's fine that you're curious, but it's kind of yet yeah, fine, but it's not fine. I don't want you over there. I want you exclusively here doing this and that's it. And so I would say, but that's not really how I work. So we have to find some common ground. And I think this person didn't want there to be common ground. I think he, he just wanted it to be his way. Um, and I think the biggest obstacle for me there was just that, you know, as somebody that I can be, or I have been in the past, <laughs> full disclosure, very impetuous. So if, you know, I'm in a position where I'm feeling like, you know, this person is trying to strangle the life out of me, I will say, you know, something here is my resignation letter. I'm not working with you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I've all, I have a deep admiration and I retain this deep admiration for people that stay in scenarios that are deeply uncomfortable for them and work through it and prevail in time. The kind of person that I am is someone that I cannot thrive in discomfort. I don't mind, you know, of course, everybody's got to get comfortable being uncomfortable and all of those sorts of things. And it's one of the ways that you learn. But in situations where I feel like, okay, if I turn left, I'm blocked. And if I turn right, I'm blocked. And if I go straight ahead, I'm blocked. Quite quickly, I'll reach the conclusion that this is perhaps a function of a personality mismatch. Um, and so in that environment, I was fortunate enough to be able to, having had having built relationships elsewhere in the company, I was able to say, this doesn't really work for me. What else can I do here? Because I'm not leaving this company. So I really like this company. I like the culture, but this microculture within this situation doesn't work for me. What can I do differently? Um, and it was one of the times, you know, when we were talking about not speaking up, it's one of the times that I was actually proud of myself for speaking up because I think younger Dav would have just said, I've got to leave. I cannot stay here because I, I, I'm suffocating. Yeah. I just, yeah. it was just a feeling of, you know, having spoken up, it, it just meant for a much better outcome. So yeah, really yeah. pleased with the result in that scenario. Yeah. I think sometimes you just, as we were literally just saying with the last bit, sometimes it's scary and you get really nervous of what people are going to say, but it is really important to feel that you're happy in a role and you're happy with the people around you. It's so, so important. I think that can sometimes slip under the radar and you feel like as long as you've got a job, it's fine, but that it's not the case. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. And what would you say is your biggest achievement? I think my biggest achievement is, um, I would say launching a business whilst being a mother of two young daughters, because I think it's one thing, you know, sometimes when you read in magazines and people say, you know, who's your biggest role model and, you know, whoever's being interviewed might come up with, you know, these celebrity role models, they might say Beyonce or Rihanna or whoever, whoever it is that they like. But I've always had this very strong sense that if I was fortunate enough to become a mother, that I would want my children and especially any girls, I would want them to look to me and see me as a role model. Even if they decided they might 
choose a completely different path. And in fact, I want them to feel free to come up with something that suits themselves and not necessarily try to retread my steps. But definitely I would, I would, I would want to feel like they could look to me and, and see an example of someone who defines for herself what success looks like, what brings her happiness and pursues it wholeheartedly. Um, and so my biggest achievement, I think, is, you know, having made so many bold moves and taken the decision to step outside of the corporate world and build a business and build it in such a way that feels that, that is organic, but that feels good to me and feels like, you know, I'm doing the right things by the rainmakers. I would just want to always know that, you know, that they could take that example on board and say, right, well, mom's done all these amazing things. So whatever it is that I want to do, I can do that too. So definitely, you know, trying to combine the two things, although it's, it's a bit of a higgledy piggledy jump, jump, you know, juggle and jumble and whatever else. Um, it's definitely still my biggest achievement by far. Amazing. I love that. I really do. Um, amazing. And we are coming to the end, but I would love to ask you for a book or podcast recommendation if you have one for us. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually really loving Banking on It by Anne Bowden. So it's Anne Bowden's that story. book. Isn't it brilliant? Oh my it's God. Fantastic. It's fantastic. <laughs> it is amazing. So many things. Well, I didn't know a lot anyway, but when I started reading it, some of the stories I she know. has to tell, I was like, wow. She's a hero, love and Bowden. Um, so there's that. And a podcast, I really like Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett. I love that podcast. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Clearly we're oh reading gosh. and listening to the same things. Yes. Love it. And sometimes when I'm working, like it's nice to just watch it on YouTube as well. Just have it in the background. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. And you have been a brilliant guest. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me, Chanel. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please do subscribe, rate and review and we will see you next week. Thanks, Chanel. To catch all episodes in the Her Future Bright series, make sure you subscribe to the Money Marketing Podcast. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Podbean and directly from moneymarketing.co.uk. Whether you've been an advisor for decades or if you're looking to start your journey, you'll find plenty of useful content on our website. To ensure you never miss out, sign up to our newsletters, register for our magazine and give us a like or follow on Twitter and LinkedIn. We also hope to see you at one of our events later in the year. Until next time, goodbye.